I am here today with Jonathan McKee, a long time, more than 20 year youth veteran and author of more than 12 books, including his brand new book, The uh, More Than Just the Talk. And so thanks for joining us, Jonathan. Hey, glad to be here. Thanks for having me. So before we dive into this specific book, give us a little bit of background on kind of what you've done ministry wise, your own family, where you live. I can see the sunshine coming through the window. Yeah, uh, here on the West Coast. Uh, this is my office here in Sacramento, California. Um, been, like you said, in youth ministry uh, a little over 20 years. Um, and when I was in youth ministry, as my own kids grew up and became teenagers, uh, I'd been, you know, working with parents for so many years, but it becomes a whole new thing when all of a sudden you got them in your own house. And all of a sudden I realized I wasn't as smart as I thought I was. And uh, so as I started raising my own kids and interacting with parents in youth ministry circles, the more I realized uh, the importance of working with parents and giving parents tools they could use, uh, even a, as a youth worker. Um, so uh, as I was writing books, I've written a bunch of youth ministry books. I started writing some parenting books, um, r really not from the uh, perspective of I've got this all down, but as a fellow struggler, a fellow parent who's like, whoops, that didn't work. So kind of taking note of, hey, here's some things that helps me connect with my kid. Uh, here's some mistakes I made. Uh, here's some ways I was able to get them to open up and, and have conversations. So that's been a lot of fun. And obviously when it comes to both the youth ministry world and the parenting world, uh, the subject of sexuality, and especially when we live in a world with so many, you know, sexually charged images and content out there, um, the kids are just, I mean, it's, it's impossible for them to, to miss these. I mean, it, you, you, you would have to lock them in a dungeon. I mean, you could never let them out of the house. I mean, you can't go to the grocery store without looking to the right or the left and seeing crazy headlines and pictures right there. And, and you know, we've had those awkward moments where, you know, our little kids even ask those awkward questions like, Dad, what's a threesome? And we're like, uh, uh, it's when you try to show up to golf and one of your guys doesn't show and you play with three, you know. And so there's those kind of moments, you know, where it's like, because these, these messages are everywhere. How do we have these conversations? And so that's really how the more than just a talk um, came about was, hey, how can we talk to our kids about truth in a world full of explicit lies? Yeah, and that, uh, that phrase, explicit lies, shows up a lot and you know you you start out you know i've as you can see from this i've i've put lots of bookmarks in here <laughs> and uh because i just found just nugget after nugget after nugget and you open up chapter two by saying this plenty of loud voices are shouting explicit lies at our kids where are the voices telling the explicit truth so can you unpack that idea of explicit lies and explicit truth and you kind of also put in there the the loud voices versus the quiet voices and uh, unpack yeah. that a lot because I a little bit because I just uh, well yeah and in, and in chapter one and it's funny and if you jump on on Amazon and you look at the reviews there's like I don't even know it was like 30 or 40 reviews of the book and some of them are like from homeschool moms and this and you'll see a lot of them say this book was terrifying but you've got to read it. And they always say it's something about it was scary, it was terrifying. And uh, part of my job is I, I study youth culture. That's a lot what I do in, in our, our the source for parents.com. We have a youth culture window and we're constantly kind of unpacking, hey, here's a lot of these lies that, that our kids are hearing all the time. So after spending a whole chapter talking about the fact that, you know, hey, if we let our kids out of the house, they're going to hear this stuff. The, the explicit lies are all over the place. Um, the the point I really make there is, hey, we know they're hearing these lies, or at least I tried to just awaken us to the fact that they are. And and sadly, let's be honest, I mean, I do parent workshops all the time, and I hear parents say, oh, my my kids don't hear that stuff, of which I just, I kind of call their bluff. I go, oh, uh, do, do you let them out of the house? Right. You know, uh, do they ever go to their friend's house? You know, I see that they've got a little... I see they've got a little device there in their hand. Uh, uh, do they, uh, you know, oh, well, we've got blocks. And very often I'll sit there and say, oh, you got blocks right here. Let's see. Oh, oh, you got iTunes. Hey, go to the top music videos right now. Hit the 30 second preview on that one right there. I mean, I'll just do that right there with a parent standing there. And, and usually parents are like, I didn't realize this. I'm like, well, your kids do. <laughs> they can tell you how to do that, you know. And, um, and the fact is, and it's not that all kids aren't, perverts and all kids aren't porn addicts and all this but 
these lies are so ubiquitous in this world. Absolutely. The fact is a lot of parents, when it comes to having this conversation, they'll say, oh, well, we had the talk once when, you know, last year. And, I, and my point is, well, they hear it about, you know, 20 times a day since then, you know, we as parents need to be having this conversation. We need to be talking about explicit truth. We need to be in the word. We need them to be, because because the Bible talks about sex a lot. Any parent who's actually started, I mean, think about it. When, whenever you have family devotions, often you'll start with Genesis. Let's read Genesis together. Right. There's some <laughs> blushing moments in Genesis. Oh, absolutely. You know? I mean, you, in the first three chapters of Genesis, you'll read about how how these angelic beings wanted to come down and have intercourse with the beautiful women on the earth. And right away, what? What's up with this? You know, um, you know, and there's, I mean, it, right away. And then, and then you'll get to the story of Onan and all this. There's some blushing moments in Genesis alone. You know, the Bible isn't afraid to talk about sex. It talks about it and it tells us the truth about it. It shows us consequences. And these are some of the conversations we need to be having. So, so if parents are bringing it up, I mean, do you, in your experience, and I know you write about this, do you do you think that there is any risk in kind of talking about it too much? Yeah, that's something I address in the book a lot because parents will come up to me and say, "Now, Jonathan, so are you saying that I'm supposed to, you know, just bring sex up, you know, at breakfast?" And the the answer I always give parents is, "We don't have to bring it up. The world brings it up all the time. All we need to do." is be ready to talk about it instead of dodging it and going, uh, 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 let's not, we don't talk about the naughty thing. Well, first of all, sex isn't a naughty thing. Sex is this wonderful gift that God gave us. And in the context of marriage, it, it, it marriage is this wonderful thing, you know? And, and if we can start talking with our kids about the truth of sex, the truth that the book of the Bible opens up with a naked guy in a garden and God looked down at him and said, Hey, it's not good for a man to be alone. Poof, naked woman, you right. know? And then he's like, and go forth and multiply. I mean, this is how the, the Bible starts. And if we could, when we're watching a TV show, when we're in the grocery store and we see that magazine on the rack, when we're walking through the mall and there's this racy poster in the front of the, you know, Victoria's Secret or whatever, and we notice our 12 year old son's glance starting to look at those posters more than the video game posters like last year, you know? Um, being able to bring that up and not make them feel naughty or perverted, but talk about, you know, you know, why, I mean, if our, if our kid were to ask that honest question, how come, how come I want to look at women like that? You know, how, how come I do, you know, we could talk about how God created us. We can move to passages like Proverbs chapter five and talk about how, you know, as a young man, you know, someday we're going to meet this woman and, and, we're going to spend the rest of our life with her and God wants us to look at her and love her and love everything about her and enjoy her and, and, and vice versa. And the more we can have these conversations about truth, instead of just saying, don't do the naughty thing, right. you know, and sadly, that's the way a lot of sex talks are. It's kind of this, let's talk about the naughty subject. Now we don't talk about this anymore. And so kids are walking around with these feelings, these desires, these questions. And sadly, the number one place that young people go to, with their questions is Google. And what do you think they find there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think some of what you just said tees up, one of, one of the whole chapters is titled The Most Enjoyable Sex. And this idea of, it's not just the naughty talk, it's not just that, that, that little side conversation we have once, but that sex is, you know, as you just said, designed by God for both procreation and pleasure. And in that chapter, The Most Enjoyable Sex, I, I love it that you, you break down three different reasons. And again, that's another one of my bookmarked pages or sections, is you look at the biblical reason, and which is so often where we stop when we have the conversation with, about, you know, what does the Bible say about sex? Yeah, this is what the Bible says. The the sci- yeah, you, you also include the scientific reason, uh, and the logical reason, which also both of those, as, as you and I have talked about, give weight to the credibility and value and authority and just good teaching of the Bible itself. So yeah. could you take just a few minutes and walk us through what you mean by the, the biblical reason, the scientific reason, and the logical reason? 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, for the mean, most enjoyable sex. It, it would do no good to tell you for the whole book have these conversations and then say good luck. So I, I tried to give you some sample of what those are. Right. And we of course provide the partner guide, which is this is a book to teenagers or young people that actually goes through those reasons and it's got discussion questions at the end of each chapter. So that way, if your kid reads it, you can actually talk about these. So yeah, it's it's. This book encourages you to have that conversation that says, okay, now here's what these conversations looks like. You know, it looks like. So in that chapter about the most enjoyable sex, the point really is, hey, this isn't just something that some ancient book says, you know, don't do the naughty thing. Enough said, you know, and right. that's it. You know, it's, it, this is something that the, that book written a couple thousand years ago is so relevant today that that our creator designed us, you know, this way. And check this out. When you look at really what scientific research is showing us, and really if you just think about this logically, and I take them through those steps, um, and as a matter of fact, I even start uh, in the book to teenagers in sex matters. In that chapter, I actually start with the science because sadly, I just work with teenagers today. And in the church, I'd say, a big chunk, I don't want to say the majority, there's research out there and it really depends on the church and depends on whatever. The majority of teenagers stay for sure, but I'd even say in the church, there's a huge chunk of teenagers that to them, the Bible isn't the end all. It's not just what the Bible says it goes. They're like, oh, okay, so forget what the ancient book says. What else? What else do you got? So I actually start with the scientific reasoning here. And I show studies, I show studies like from the journal, I'll give one example, journal, uh, uh, the psychology today. There was a guy in there who basically decided to ask, um, hey, who's happier? Uh, those who have lots of sex with whoever they want, whenever they want, or those who are monogamous and choose kind of one person for life, so to speak. And, and I go into some other details because there's actually what's called serial monogamy, which is one person at a time. I'm in a relationship with this person for a couple of years and oh, then we broke up now another person, but one at a time, that's serial monogamy. But the person who's monogamous compared to the person who's promiscuous, I, I just go out and have sex whenever I feel like because it's fun, it's recreational. Um, and so in comparing promiscuity to monogamy, um, you know, this, this guy did all kinds of research. And as a matter of fact, I cite tons of research, because they all find the same thing. And that is that the more promiscuous people are, for some reason, those people are less happy. And that word happy keeps coming up. Right. In fact, the more porn, uh, more p porn, that sounds a little Freudian slip there, more <laughs> prone, more prone to depression. Um, as a matter of fact, the more partners people had, the more likely they were to be depressed, and, and I, I cite a bunch of this research. One guy was a skeptic, and the reason I like to kind of actually cite what secular research says is because there's a lot of Christian kids who are like, okay, you've only got Christians talking here. I, I cited what secular people were saying. Right. And this one guy said, okay, he is using this word happy. Define happy. And what I like is he actually said, hey, the promiscuous person is kind of happy in their own way. Here's how they're happy. They enjoy that feeling, the bliss of sex. Um, they enjoy, and it cites some of the things they enjoy, of which some of the things are the things that God created. Hey, sex feels good. Duh. It does if you're with your spouse, too, you know? Um, and so he cites some of those things. But then he says, and here's where the monogamous person, the person that has that one partner, is happy. They have a more fulfilling, long lasting happiness. <clears throat> and Basically, he makes like a chart of here's where the, you know, here's what the people that are monogamous enjoy and how happy they are. Here's the people that are promiscuous, what they enjoy. And the funny thing is, he, his conclusion, his secular conclusion was, I think the best bet would be finding that really cool, he almost calls it animalistic, um, fun sex within your monogamous relationship. Because then you could have the best of both worlds. You could have that bliss, that great sex with that person, with that longer lasting fulfillment. So it's funny, the more we look at secular research, the more we found that, hey, God's plan for finding one person and enjoying an amazing sexual relationship with this person for life is, is really a pretty cool plan. And that's something I spell out in this book to young people. And then the fun thing is, then I go and I talk about it in this book as well, 
Then I'm like, oh, now let's look at what the Bible says. Hey, the Bible says the same thing. Huh, wouldn't you know it? And by the way, then I say, now just close your eyes for a second and picture this world. And I kind of take them through an exercise where they themselves say logically, and I take them through an exercise where they picture this world and a lot of the, hey, if I did whatever I want versus if we just stuck with one person for life. And I take them to this exercise where they basically um, ask logically what's the best. And in all three of the scenarios, what the Bible says, what science says, what logic says, the overwhelming conclusion is, hey, one person for life sounds pretty good. Right. Um, and that's a message that we need to be having. <clears throat> These are conversations we need to have with our kids, not just once, not just one talk, but a lot. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I, I found myself reading that chapter going, this makes so much sense for the same exact reasons that you just said, that when when this generation sees the scientific reason, the logical reason, it's just reaff and then they see that the Bible says the same thing, they're more likely to then go to the Bible for for everything else, right? I mean, yeah. if, I can, if I can trust it on something that I'm thinking about as much as sex, I could probably trust it on this and that and the other. And so, I mean, I yeah. found well, myself. You know, it's interesting. In fact, this Sunday, I speak to a group of kids in Southern California. Um, and I just saw I was in South Carolina a few months ago and speaking to 3,000 kids. And when I talk to young people about sex, it's funny. People wouldn't predict this. I often will do an altar call at the end of the talk because – it's so clear how much God loves us and he designed this awesome, you know, this awesome thing for us that we get to enjoy. And it's so clear that his way is best. And as a matter of fact, when I take him through that logical exercise, the kind of clear thing is, wow, you know, his way really is cool. It, you know, in just this one area of sex, imagine if we listen to him in all areas of our lives, not just in this area of sex. And very often, um, I'll, I'll give an invitation. I'll be like, hey, you know, maybe there's some areas of our life we really need to give up to God. Maybe you haven't done that. And, and because it's just such a clear presentation of how much God loves us and how much he wants the best for us. And when we step outside of his plan, uh, lots of times there's consequences that hurt, you know, which is why I spend a, a chapter in both these books talking about, hey, what if I messed up? Um, is it too late? And that's where we can really talk about Jesus' grace and his uh, forgiveness and how Jesus didn't look at our past, but he looked at our future. Um, because a lot of kids have made mistakes and they're carrying guilt. And uh, wait, it's too late for me. And we need to have those conversations as well. Right. And you've, yeah, you've got a whole a whole chapter in that. Just so, so, so people have an idea that you know, the, co the contents of this, you know, we've already covered some of the chapters, but some of the other ones that I, I love that you just address it head on. It goes back to that whole explicit lies, explicit truth that, you know, address a whole chapter specifically about, you know, how far is too far and mm -hmm. a chapter devoted to your daughter, a conversation devoted to your son and what mm -hmm. it means to flee and, and a whole chapter on porn and another on masturbation, another on what you just referenced, which is past mistakes. And what do you, what do you tell the kid who has already made some decisions that don't line up with what you're telling them now? And where does grace fit into this? And so, kind of, I mean, I love that you cover all of those, again, very explicitly. And then toward the end, you, you address this idea, which, which you've given a great tool for in Sex Matters, but uh, is this idea of what do I do when kids ask tough questions? And you have yeah. this three-part kind of framework of, you know, don't freak out, tell me more, what do you think? Walk us through what because we're going to get tough questions. We're going to get those awkward moments where they say, well, what about what you did? Or what, what, what about this? Or, um, yeah. So yeah. What, what, what's your, you know, when, a, when a parent says, Hey, how can I be prepared? Not just informationally, but emotionally and reactionally, if that's a word <laughs> to what do I do when my kids ask tough questions? No, no, that, that's a good question. And the, and the biggest thing that I, the biggest piece of advice and this piece of advice actually is given throughout the book. Um, but one of the biggest pieces of advice I give the parents in this book is don't freak out. Um, I have a PhD in overreaction. All right. My, my kids would tell me that. Okay. You know, that, and so many times I've, I've learned by, oh, wow, well that just shut every, you know, all the progress I've had lately, I just shut it all down by, you know, by blowing up. And the funny thing is if our kids 
actually, you know, in the book I talk about the number one place that young people go today for their questions is Google. Because think about it. If there's, you know, let's just say hypothetically that our kids have encountered some sexually explicit pictures or they're struggling with lust or they're maybe they've discovered masturbation and, you know, and think about it. Your kid, you know, how many of our kids are going to come up to mom or dad and say, you know, frankly, I've seen these explicit images. They're coming through my handheld device. Um, I'm actually starting to masturbate all the time. It's controlling me. I don't know what to do. You know, that's an embarrassing thing to ask. And a lot of parents, it's like, wait, what, what device? What do you see? I'm going to give me that device. Where did you hear this? Was it from that boy, Chris? Was it, you know, I mean, immediately yeah. it's kind of like the, you know, the also now I'm discovering information and we jump into, you know, I'm going to correct this mode and I'm going to bust you. And as, as opposed to my kid is here asking for help, you know? So the key thing is don't freak out. As a matter of fact, uh, Shanti Feldman, um, who endorsed the book, I actually quoted her because um, she did this awesome study where she asked young people and she does all kinds of good research. And she asked them, hey, you know, would you talk to your parents with embarrassing questions? And three quarters of them said they would if they were guaranteed that they wouldn't freak out. And most of them said, but they will freak out. So I want to ask them, you know, and so that's the biggest advice I give parents is to not um, freak out. And, and I also give them some tips, like in the porn chapter, I say, if you discover your kid looking at porn, um, not freaking out is always a start. But then I always talk about like buying some time to think about your decision. And I'm thinking of myself as an imperfect parent myself. I know that if I just say the first thing, it's usually not a wise thing. Yeah. So um, for me, sometimes, you know, I give the advice of actually, hey, I want you to set your phone on the table. I want you to go to your room and I'm going to pray about this. I'm going to think about this. And the cool thing is that's kind of a nice dual thing. One, making them wait. They hate that. It's kind of a punishment in themselves. We're going to talk about this tomorrow. You know, we're going to talk about this later tonight. And some of our kids will be like, no, I want to talk about it now. You know, come on, what are you going to do? Are you going to take my phone away? Right. You know, and if you just leave the phone there and, you know, so, so don't freak out Buy yourself some time. Think about it. Then I also give some tips about like, if, if it's something and, and parents come to me all the time, parent workshops, and they've always got this thing in their hand. And they're like, what do I, what do I do with this? I caught them doing this on this device, you know, and it's fill in, the, you know, some social media site they weren't supposed to be on, whatever, you know, um, again, don't freak out, set the phone down. I want to think about this, but often I'll bring them down and be like, Hey, um, what do you think the problem is here? Asking them, get them talking instead of you lecturing, get it, to, you know, and then what do you think I could do to help you with this? So we don't run into this again. And again, get them to propose the punishment, not necessarily the punishment, but the correction. And what they might come up with something really good. They might come up with something you haven't even thought of, you know, that's really, you know, I'd like your help. And what if you did this? And they're like, what if you took my phone away for a month? You're like, I was only going to take it away for a week. You know, you know a month sounds good, Junior. You know, and so, right. so, so I propose some of these things where we can start talking anytime. In fact, uh, my, I have this book, the Get Your Teenager Talking. And one of the things I keep talking about in this book is because uh, in this book, I basically give a you know a couple at the beginning. This is on my Amazon page and on the source for parents dot com. I, I spend just a little bit in the front of the book saying, hey, here's some ways to open up conversation in your house. And then I spend the rest of the book with just a bunch of fun questions and discussion starters. Well, one thing we talk about in this all the time is how do we create dialogue instead of monologue? Right. In other words, in my house, very often, you know, all of a sudden, I'd be like, kids, sit down and listen to my last knowledge, right. you know, lecture time. And we need to turn our lecturing into listening. We need to find opportunities to start this dialogue instead of this one-way monologue where they're tuning out and they're like, forget it, I should have gone to Google. We need to basically create a climate of comfortable conversations. As a matter of fact, I spent a whole chapter <laughs> in this talking about what that looks like in your house. Good, good. Well, man, I... I feel like I could go go on forever, and I'd love to. I, I, as you're talking, I'm thinking I'd love to devote a whole conversation to this topic and this topic because I think that while the conversation is is crucial, and we need, and I completely agree with that. I think also some of the ideas for what what do we do to we can't stop them from getting the messages, but what do we do to at least 
lessen the chance it's going to happen by accident on their phone or on their browsers yeah. or whatever. And I know that you've done a lot of that. And I, and I, you know, want to want to keep this. I we're kind of running out of time here to keep this under thirty minutes. But uh, I, I'd love to if you'd be willing to come back sometime and and do a conversation with what is what is the best kind of preparation <laughs> that parents can do when they're handing their kid their first smartphone or their first tablet yeah. or their you know first computer and what are some parameters you have found that have at least reduced the risk so yeah. that it doesn't just happen all the time because yeah. as you know as you quote at the beginning of the book uh, another one of my bookmark pages <laughs> when you talk about 69 this this is going full circle all the way back to when you said some people wrote reviews that this was scary 69% you know, your research says so 69% of kids hide their online behavior from their parents. And, you know, and 74% of parents say they don't have time to monitor it. And I'm, I'm thinking that's just, and, and their, and their strategy is to hope for the best. And I remember somebody once saying to me, hope is not a strategy. <laughs> and, and so I, I mean, I'd love to, to pick your brain more about yeah. that sometime, but for, and for so, now and so. people, you know, people can obviously go to Amazon and find both, uh, more than just the talk and the companion guide for conversation for kids, uh, or for teenagers, um, that sex matters, but how can they connect with you? If somebody wants to connect with you, whether it's on Facebook or Twitter, what, where, where do you hang out that if people want to find out more about you and, um, how can they do that? Yeah, yeah, no, and get some of those, and even that conversation, which would be fun to have that conversation of, uh, I mean, the biggest question I get after parent workshops is usually something to do with this device and boundaries, and well, what age should I get, you know, because in my parent workshops, I show that even secular doctors, like Journal of Pediatrics says, don't give uh, mobile devices to kids under 12 years old, you know, and I know tons of Christian parents that are buying their six-year-olds iPads, you know, and stuff like that. And if you've got, you know, literally, if you could pick up the Huffington Post or the Journal Psych, you know, of Psychology Today or, P, you know, the Journal Pediatrics, and they're saying, stop giving kids devices. This isn't focus on family saying this. This is your doctor is saying this. Right. Um, these are good pieces of advice to listen to. We talk about that a lot. I have a book that my friend Doug Fields and I wrote called Should I Smash My Kid's Phone? <laughs> and, uh, and that book, which is also on Amazon.com or on the source for parents.com, if you just look at the source number four parents.com, you'll see articles about that stuff. You'll see that book, Should I Smash My Kid's Phone, um, which is actually a workbook parents can go through to start looking about, hey, what would be too strict? Like saying, no email, no phone, no nothing for my 17 year old. Well, that's funny, they're joining the Marines and they're gonna be on their own in six months anyway. Are you sure maybe I shouldn't have these conversations now? No, just nothing, you know, versus the parent that at, you know, 10 year olds like here, have everything, no boundaries, you know. Um, how do you start having those conversations? Obviously the chapter on porn talks a lot about that. So, um, but yeah, a lot of those questions, a good central place if you wanna find me is jump on the source for parents.com the source number four parents.com and uh, you'll see my blog there you'll see our youth culture window articles if you jump on amazon and you search for jonathan mckee and uh you get the spelling right um then uh you'll see uh you'll see my author page and all the books i've written there and um you can access those books there on amazon or on the source for parents.com and um and yeah you, i'd love to have that dialogue i come out to churches all the time and and speak in this and I'd love to come to your church. Yeah, yeah. So I and I am look, looking at ways that we can get you up here to to Seattle to to make that happen. So because that'd be I'd love to talk to the three Christians in Seattle. Right. <laughs> awesome. There are, few, there are a few more of us. We got a family of five, so watch it. Oh, there we go. Okay. <laughs> That's cool. That's cool. <laughs> but uh, anyhow, thanks so much for joining us again. The, Author is Jonathan McKee. The book is more than just the talk and the companion guide uh, for your teenagers, Sex Matters. I highly recommend both. I told Jonathan kind of preliminary to this interview that uh, I think this should be required reading for every parent uh, that has a middle school or high school student. So Jonathan, thanks again for taking the time. Uh, go you. enjoy that sunshine. And believe it or not, I'm gonna do the same here in Seattle. <laughs> awesome, thank you.